Hello, my name is Sujit Kunan. Welcome you to the, this, this tutorial on law relating to wildlife protection in India. Purpose of this module is to provide an understanding on the laws relating to protection of wildlife in India. And it also we also will di discuss the context in which wildlife laws in India has been developed and I including in its historical context. And we will also discuss key issues and challenges including the role of judiciary in the development of wildlife protection laws in India. The context, the, the context in which the law relating to wildlife protection in India has been developed, if we look at these things, I mean, India contributes significantly to the biological diversity, I mean, even at the global level. For example, I mean, India is quite known for its rich wildlife diversity. And it, it, it's needless to explain the role of wildlife in maintaining the biological, ecological balance. Means, I mean, if anything affects the wildlife, that can have implications of implications on the overall ecology. So this is the context in which these wildlife laws in India, I mean, this is the context in which wildlife laws has been evolved and that in that's also the case in India. So the rationale behind wildlife laws in India is mainly the extinction of species. A large number of species has been extincted or many species are in the verge of extinction in the contemporary context. There are quite a few important reasons why this wildlife, I mean, many species are facing extinction. I mean, most important is the habitat destruction. Habitat destruction means, I mean, <coughs> for example, I mean, the, the situation of forest in India. Whatever affects the forest, that can have direct implication upon wildlife also. And another major, major, major <coughs> factor affecting wildlife in India is hunting and, and also trade in animals. Trading in animals and animal stuff has been a major reason even at the, at the international level that affects the overall health of wildlife. And that's also the case in India, India as well. So what we can see is, I mean, these are the major three important reasons probably why the wildlife law in India has been developed. That is habitat destruction, hunting, trading in animals. So what has been the legal responses to address these problems? I mean, when we look at a little bit in the historical context, I mean, wildlife laws in India is not a new phenomenon. It has been there even, I mean, the history of wildlife laws can even date back to pre-colonial pre -colonial era. For example, Emperor Ashwagas during the period 296, 277 BC, there are several edicts during, uh, during the period of Emperor, Ash uh, Emperor Ashoka that can have, that is directly linked to wildlife protection. For example, some of these edicts are directly related to prohibition of killing of animals. And when we move on to the colonial period, I mean, while th there, are there are more than one <coughs> laws relating to wildlife protection during the colonial period. For example, Wild Birds Protection Act 1887. And major purpose of this, this statute was prohibition of possession or as well as sale of certain birds during a particular period, during a particular period. Another major legislation was Wild Birds and Animals Protection Act 1912 and this was later on amended in 1935. This is a landmark legislation in the context that I mean this is the statute or law that per perhaps for the first time introduced this idea of sanctuary. Sanctuary in the sense protected, area, protected areas for conservation of wildlife. And thi this 1912 Act, Wild Birds and Animals Protection Act 1912, as amended in 1935, it also, uh, it also carried some provisions that prohibits killing of certain animals. And while this has been the pre-colonial as well as the colonial context, I mean, the independent India, I mean, the major comprehensive legislation was enacted in 1972, that was Wildlife Protection Act. In this module, we will be overwhelmingly focusing on this, this statute that is Wildlife Protection Act 1972, its major provisions, its key features, as well as the role of judiciary or, or the, the jurisprudence developed upon this statute in, uh, triggered by the Indian judiciary, especially the Supreme Court of India. I mean, before we, go, before we get into the substantive aspects of Wildlife Protection Act, let's have a brief outline of what is the constitutional context of wildlife protection in India. Whether there is any provision in the constitution of India that deals with wildlife protection. There are quite a few, there are a couple of, at least a couple of provisions that deal with, that deal with wildlife protection. 
For example, I mean in, in the section on directive principles of state policy, there is article 48A explicitly, expressly deals with duty of the state to protect wildlife. And similarly, in, in the section on fundamental duties of citizens, article 51A G, it also talks about duty of all citizens to protect wildlife in India. So, to emphasize these provisions, I mean wh what they ask is a duty from the state as well as from the, of the duty of the state as well as of the citizens to preserve, protect and safeguard wildlife in India. And there is another section, another part of article 51 AG that requires all citizens or that, that makes citizens duty bound to have compassion for living creature. And this provision or this part of article 51 AG can be directly linked to this issue of cruelty to animals because the word used in article 51 AG is compassion. That means I mean compassion towards animals and that can be interpreted as, as putting a duty upon citizens not to be cruel towards animals. And there is another, another section, another provision in the constitution that is relevant in the context of wildlife is who has the power to enact law on wildlife protection. As you may already know that I mean there are, there, there is, there are certain provisions in the constitution that divides legislative power between the, the parliament and the state legislatures. For, for example, uh, that means there are three lists, union list, state list and concurrent list as provided in the constitution. All those subject matters enlisted in the union list, the parliament has the exclusive power to make laws. Similarly, all those subject matters in the state list, state legislatures has, have the exclusive power to make laws. And as far as subject matters in the concurrent list is concerned, both the parliament and the state legislatures have equally the power to enact laws. So in this context, I mean, a, a, originally the constitution had uh, included wildlife in the state list. And this, this scenario was changed in 1976 through Constitution 42nd Amendment Act. And through this amendment, the subject matter wildlife was included in the concurrent list. So the legal implication is as of now, the situation is, is both the parliament as well as the state legislatures can enact laws on wildlife protection. But however, as we look at the Wildlife Protection Act, this was enacted in 1972. The amendment was adopted in 1976. So when the Wildlife Protection Act 1972 was adopted, I mean the, 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 the subject matter wildlife was part of the state list. That means that in 1972, it was in the exclusive domain of the state legislatures to enact any law on wildlife protection. However, this 1972 act is a, is a central legislation. So we will just look at how it, was, how it was possible for the parliament to enact Wildlife Protection Act 1972. There is a provision in the constitution that is article 252. According to article 252, any subject matter which falls within the state list can, I mean the law can be enacted on those subject matter by the parliament provided two or more states have passed a resolution to that effect. That means if states are willing, they can concede their power to the parliament or they can grant, they can permit the parliament to enact law. This is the context in which or this is the provision through which the Wildlife Protection Act 1972 was passed by the parliament. And this after 1972, this had undergone at, at least four or five amendments that is in 1982, 86, 1991, 2002 and 2006. And all these amendments, <coughs> all these amendments in included a number of significant changes to this 1972 act and some of them are for example originally it was meant only for wild animals so through these amendments plants were also included and originally and, and these amendments also tried to strengthen the power of um, power of the central government as far as this regulation or the protection of wildlife in India is concerned. There is a recent bill that is, to, that is Wildlife Protection Amendment Bill 2013 is pending before the parliament. So now let, <coughs> let's have a discussion on the substantive aspect of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. What are the major purposes of this Wildlife Protection Act 1972? I mean the ma major, major purpose as it is clear from the title of the act is to protect wildlife. 
and we had already mentioned or we had already discussed this context in which this act was enacted because many species were were ex either extinct or in the verge of extinction so the purpose of the act was to how to curtail or control this wildlife and how to protect and conserve the existing population or how to nurture the the, the wildlife population wi wildlife population in india so the major legal measures i mean if you look at the substantive part of the wildlife protection act 1972 the major legal measures are one prohibition of hunting of wild animals this is mainly because hunting was considered or hunting was one of the major reasons why this wildlife was uh, <coughs> wildlife population was affected second and the similar similar provisions are also there as far as these plants are concerned for example there are provisions that prohibit uprooting of plants and the third major substantive measure is protection and management of wildlife, wildlife habitats because habitat destruction was one of the major reasons one of the major threats for wildlife population in India. So Wildlife Protection Act 1972 introduced protection and management of wildlife the natural habitats of wildlife and this is in mainly in the form of sanctuaries and national parks and Another major, <coughs> the other, the fourth major legal measure is regulation and control of trade in wildlife and parts and products because this, this huge lucrative market for wildlife products or wildlife stuff, wildlife trophies uh, is one of the major reasons why wildlife population is affected. So the Wildlife Act Protection Act 1972 has some provisions that regulates or control or prohibit trade in wildlife. And fifth major legal measure is is again it is related to the protection of wildlife habitat but through through i mean this this is mainly aiming to protect wildlife uh, wildlife in captivity this is mainly by establishing and managing zoos so first this regulation of hunting what are the major provisions or what is the nature of the provisions that regulate hunting in india because wildlife act wildlife protection act 1972 that follows a schedule system it contains four schedules schedules 1 2 3 and 4 and several i mean wildlife species are species are included in these schedules according to according to the nature of protection they demand for example if some species are, are really in the verge of extinction probably a more stringent regulation or control is needed probably prohibition of hunting is hunting is required as far as that particular animal or plant is concerned so, whereas if some of them are i mean their their population is relatively safe but if some kind of regulation is not adopted i mean they might they might become they might <coughs> they might be at the, they might be pushed towards the extinction put towards extinction in such cases a lighter lighter level of regulation may be may be necessary in that case this is the logic behind this having different kind of schedules and as we move on from schedule 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 i mean the, the standard or the strength or stringency of the regulation regulation gets diluted for example the most stringent regulation or restriction applies in the case of schedule one animals for example i mean the general rule is hunting of animals included in schedule one is is prohibited and this prohibition however is not absolute and this is subject to some exceptions for example there are mainly two exceptions to this prohibition that is if hunting of animal hunting of schedule one animal is permitted if that particular animal has become dangerous to human life Two, if that particular animal is so disabled or diseased as to be beyond recovery, that as we can see, there are there are two critical or there are two critical conditions or conditions upon which hunting of Schedule One animal is a, is permitted. And one is if particular animal is dangerous to human life. And two, if that particular if that particular uh, the second condition is in the interest of that particular animal because if that particular animal is so disabled or diseased and then the, the possibility of recovery is either nil or or extremely less in that case i mean these are the two extreme situations in which hunting of schedule one animal is permitted and one for protecting human life for two i mean in the in, in the interest of that particular animal so that means i mean there are there are, there's this virtually no other other situations where schedule one and the hunting of schedule one animal is not permitted under the wildlife protection act 1972 as far as hunting of schedule two three and four animals are concerned I mean, this is more or less similar to what we had just discussed however this the stringency is is slightly diluted 
as we can see hunting of schedule 2 3 and 4 animals are permitted if, uh, if there are there are three conditions at least i mean when compared to schedule 1 animals there is one more condition has been added Th and that is i mean the, the existing condition is like if animal has become dangerous to human life that is to protect human life then the other is if that particular animal is so sick or deceased and uh, and the recovery is not possible or the chances of recovery is extremely less the third condition is that the, this is the critical i mean the dilution part when we compare it to the schedule 1 animals that is a uh, hunting of animal listed in schedule 2 3 and 4 is uh, can also be permitted to protect property property this includes standing crops as well so that means the relaxation as you can see is that it is not just for human life but it's also hunting of Schedule 2, 3 and 4 animal is also permitted for protection of property that includes crops. I mean this is in the context I mean where I mean animals, I mean wild animals sometimes pose threat to agriculture or standing crops. So if it is scheduled 2 or 3 or 4 animals and the hunting can be permitted as far as those animals are concerned if such animals pose threat to standing crops. There is another situation in which hunting can be permitted provide can be permitted that is for research and educational purposes but there are several conditions conditions <coughs> to be satisfied as far as this this issue is concerned for example permission of chief wildlife warden is mandatory for permission of hunting for this research and educational purposes again the purposes has been mentioned explicitly in the in the statute and this includes i mean quote unquote it is education scientific research collection of specimens or if it is for recognized zoos or for museums and uh, similar institutions. And there is a, a third major condition uh, situation upon which this hunting of animals for research and educational purposes is allowed is if it is for preparation of snake venom for manufacturing of life saving drugs. So what we can see is I mean hunting can be permitted there are two conditions it can be permitted only by the chief wildlife warden and this, 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 can, uh, this can be permitted only for certain purposes like scientific research and education or for preparation of certain medicines like venoms. And if it is schedule 1 animal even, even for research and educational purposes prior permission from the central government is mandatory whereas, if, whereas for schedule 2, 3 and 4 animals this per prior permission from the state government is required. I mean, this shows a kind of stringency as far as Schedule 1 animal when compared to two, Schedule 2 and 3 and 4 are concerned. For example, Schedule as far as Schedule 1 animals are concerned, this <coughs> the, the power has been vested with the central government, but whereas for other, sh other schedules or uh, animals in the other schedules are concerned, prior permission, I mean, the, the, the per power to give prior permission has been vested with the state government. So what we can see is, I mean, as far as Schedule 1 animal is concerned, utmost precaution and screening has been envisaged under the, the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. But however, there's one issue to be discussed is, I mean, how central government is better than the state government as far as issuing this permit is concerned. Apparently, the Wildlife Protection Act 1972 is, seems to be following a presumption that, I mean, central government is perhaps the best protector of the interest of wildlife is wildlife when compared to state government but there is no empirical probably there is no empirical evidence to substantiate this however i mean this is one way that uh, wildlife protection act 1972 provides stringent regulation as far as hunting of schedule 1 animal for research and educational purposes is concerned and as I had already mentioned that I mean Wildlife Protection Act 1972 even though originally it was meant only for animals I mean later on through an amendment plants were also included. But as far as these plants are concerned this also follows a kind of schedule approach as followed in the case of wild animals. For example this all regulations envisaged under the, sh under the Wildlife Protection Act 1972 is applicable only to specified plants. Specified plan means plans notified by the central government. So what are the major legal regulations applicable to plants? One is, the, I mean, destruction of specified plans. That means destruction of those plants enlisted in, the, in the, the central government notification is prohibited and trading in those specified plants are also prohibited. That means 
destruction and trading are prohibited apparently it presumes or it is based upon the premise that i mean this destruction and trading i mean trading is one of the major reasons why some of these plants are <coughs> are being destroyed and another major regulation is picking uprooting and acquisition of against specified plants in the case of picking uprooting and acquisition the regulatory appro approach is such actions require prior permission from the chief wildlife warden and this is this can only be permitted for a certain purposes that is educational and research and scientific research another ma another major substantive substantive part is habitat protection as we had already mentioned in the beginning like i mean habitat destruction is one of the major threat faced by wildlife in india so wildlife protection act envisages habitat protection as one of the major goals and there are i mean it it, it uh, 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 in the wildlife protection act this habitats has been the habitat protection has been designed or envisaged as in the in the form of declaration of sanctuaries national park conservation reserve and community reserve that means there are three four kinds of protected areas envisaged under the wildlife protection act 1972 so the critical questions in this in in this context is how these protected areas are determined who makes the decision and what are the legal implications when whenever <coughs> there is a decision to declare protected areas whether it is a sanctuary national park conservation reserve or community reserve so we will discuss discuss these protected areas one by one first national parks and sanctuaries the major criteria for declaring any particular area as a national parks and sanctuary is where if that particular area is is so crucial for sustenance of wildlife so that means the idea behind is to find a natural habitat that is crucial for protection and conservation of wildlife and then declare that particular area as a protected area and this power to declare or power to determine and declare such protected areas i mean power to power to determine and declare national parks and sanctuaries vest with the state government so that means the state government has the power to 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 determine if there is a particular natural habitat that are that is so crucial for wildlife protection and conservation and then they can declare it as a protected area that means a national park or a sanctuary under the wildlife protection act 1972 so the, the another then the critical question is what are the legal consequences when they declare a particular area as a national park or a sanctuary i mean four major major legal regulations that are being applicable in the case of national park and sanctuaries is like restriction of human actions one of the purposes for declaring a national park or 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 a sanctuary is to restrict human interference in that in that natural habitat this is partly because i mean human interference or human intervention is is one of the major reasons or one of the major threat for wildlife wildlife and the second major thing a ma major legal consequence is prohibition of activities that lead to destruction of wildlife and it it could be like clearing of forest or burning or cultivation whatever so and the third major thing is prohibition of commercial exploitation of of natural habitat that means prohibition of commercial exploitation of that national park or sanctuary and <coughs> the declaration or the determination of national park and sanctuary also leads to restriction of several customary rights of uh, for traditional forest dwellers or tribes which includes grazing and private tenurial rights so what we can see from all sim these legal regulations is the primary purpose is to detach human beings or insulate the natural habitat of wildlife from human inter or from human beings so to put it in a different way to completely prohibit or regulate strictly the human interference or human activity in the natural habitat of wildlife or determined wildlife determined wildlife habitat the third and fourth category of protected areas is conservation and community reserve and originally th this idea was not in the in the wildlife protection act 1972 and this was later on included through 9, 2002 amendment which came into force in 2003 the purpose of this is i mean the, the the idea of sanctuaries and national park focuses on the natural habitat per se and that means what happened to the adjacent areas and this this came i mean 
<coughs> this idea of conservation and community reserve was adopted with because of the realization that there are several adjacent areas that are also so critical for the conservation of wildlife e wildlife in e wildlife within the national park or the sanctuary or a sanctuary that means this 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 idea of corridors were were, were wildlife quite often moves so the moment they are outside the wildlife wildlife sanctuary or national park i mean they they, they may face some kind of problems or they may face <coughs> they may they may be unsafe outside those protected areas so this was probably the idea idea behind this introduction of is conservation and community reserve that means the purpose was to cover areas adjacent to national parks and sanctuaries to cover areas that links different protected areas so that means the second the second seems to address this issue of protection of of wildlife corridors that means the the, the corridors through which the wildlife moves from one protected areas to one protected area to another protected area then who has the power to determine this conservation and community reserve it is, i mean wildlife according i mean uh, wildlife protection act of 1972 west state government with this power to declare conservation and community reserve and <coughs> the act also envisages the institutional mechanism for um, for conservation and community reserves that is community reserve management committee and community a conservation reserve management committee that means a manage com management committee for both conservation and community reserve and again i mean this committee will be established by the state government and the major purpose of this community this, this committee these committees is to or major function of this committee is to aid and advise the chief wildlife warden as far as his management and conservation of these reserves are concerned but what is the difference between this community reserve and uh, and the uh, and the conservation reserve conservation reserve is the idea if the if a particular adjacent place is it belongs to the government and then that will be considered as conservation reserve if it is a, is a private land or a community land then that will be termed as community reserve and the, the major difference is while the government can decide whether it wants to de wants to declare a particular land which is adjacent to a national park or sanctuary as a conservation re conservation reserve it might face some problem if it is a private land or a community land so the idea is if it is a private land or community land then the then the idea on the proposal has to come from that private per the, uh, that particular private person or a community and also also the government has that means the government needs permission from the private the community or the private individuals to declare or determine a particular area as a community reserve so if you just uh, look at some latest statistics like what happened to this community reserve and co conservation reserve as on 2014 i mean there are total 56 conservation reserves whereas there's only four community reserves so that seems to indicate that i mean this this idea of community reserve is very difficult to implement probably because it requires permission or consent from pr the private or community land and this all these four community reserves were were discuss, were were notified in 2007 so that means since 2007 there has not been any any new community reserves whereas conservation is reserve concern it, it it shows that the statistics shows shows some kind of consistent increase in number of determined number of conservation reserves now let's briefly look at this institutional mechanism as designed under the wildlife protection act there are there are a couple of institutional mechanisms in which i mean designed under the act the most important one is probably i mean in addition to chief wildlife warden and national board for wildlife national board for uh, wildlife and state board for wildlife there is this institution called national wildlife crime control bureau this was established in 2007 and its major function is to address the issue of crime of or wildlife crimes and i mean it it's it's uh, it's its major function is advisory in nature it collects and collates in the i mean data relating to wildlife crimes and it it passes this data to the central government as well as the state government so the idea is to provide statistics and uh, and knowledge as far as wildlife crime is concerned so that the central government as well as the state government can take appropriate actions another major institution is central zoo authority 
and as we had already mentioned because su i mean su is another major reason i mean determination or notification of su or maintenance of su is another major measure through which wildlife protection has been envisaged or wildlife conservation has been envisaged under the statute that is this central su authority was established 1992 under chapter 4a of the wildlife protection act the major purpose of this su authority is to recognize or derecognize as su that means it can recognize as well as derecognize as su according to the standards and facilities available in a su it can also lay down standards for keeping animals in a su so that means the, the major powers the regulatory powers as far as su is concerned is vested with central su authority another major another <coughs> major institution is the national tiger conservation authority this was uh, established in 2006 under section 38o of the wildlife protection act as you can see i mean this is um, uh, either i mean this is a, a species specific authority that is it meant for um, conservation of tigers in india so this th this could be partly because i mean tiger is a national animal or maybe i mean the 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 sustenance or a healthy tiger population in a habitat perhaps that shows the healthy health the overall health of that wildlife habitat or wild other wildlife in in that particular habitat what could be the uh, whatever may be the reasons i mean this authority specifically looks at tiger conservation in india <coughs> another major contribution as far as i mean wildlife protection act or wildlife protection law in india is role of the judiciary judiciary has been playing significant role i mean a significant role <coughs> as far as this development of jurisprudence on wildlife protection laws in india is concerned for example i mean there are there are quite a few few important case laws that discusses either the scope or whether hunting can be allowed or not or whether what kind of activities can be permitted in a, in a, in a natural habitat such as a national park or a, or or a sanctuary so there are quite a few cases but our purpose is not to discuss all those cases or it's 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 not possible to prepare an exhaustive list of all those cases that deals with but what we are doing right now is to is to discuss some of the important cases and that contributed so that i mean it it becomes an illustration like what kind of roles roles have been played by the judiciary and that that's also an indication at what kind of roles a judiciary can play in the development of wildlife <coughs> development of wildlife jurisprudence in india and one of the important case law i mean one of the important area where the judiciary has played played an important role is appointment of chief wildlife ward even though it was mentioned in the in the in the 1972 act many state many gov many state governments did not appoint chief wildlife warden and that happened to be a major reason because chief wildlife wildlife warden is in, is entrusted with several key functions under the 1972 act so if wildlife warden has not been appointed the whole regulatory the regulatory measures envisaged under the 1972 act that affect so in the center for environmental law this wwf case in 1997 the court court issued a strong direction to all state governments to app, to appoint chief wildlife warden apparently this in, this intervention by the judiciary judiciary <coughs> brought about significant results as far as this appointment of chief wildlife warden is concerned another major major role played by the judiciary was i mean judiciary was as far as the implementation of implementation of this uh, y 1972 act is concerned for example again in in, in wwf this is the second case in 1992 the court co <coughs> court identified this identified there is a loophole in the implementation mechanism and directed the government to provide modern arms and ammunition so on communication facilities to forest guards and <coughs> and this we, we can see that i mean judiciary is slowly stepping into the area of executives and deciding or de uh, or determining what actions are necessary for the proper implementation of the 1972 act so in, in the same case in the same case the court also directed to take initiate take steps for immunization of animals and animals around protected areas this was based upon the realization that i mean there could be some kind of interaction between wildlife within the protected areas and wildlife outside the protected areas. areas or if if we do not address wildlife outside protection areas that then it the, is possible that wildlife within the protected area could contract some diseases from other animals so this was the context in which the court directed to take steps for immunization of animals outside the protected areas 
another controversial issue where judiciary had to face or judiciary provided significantly or played significant role is as is is in the case of trade in wildlife and the major issue in this context was i mean wildlife protection versus freedom of trade because as we had already mentioned i mean trading in wildlife is a lucrative business lucrative business and this was identified as one of the major reasons why i mean wildlife is facing extinction and this 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 happened i mean this case came when it came up before the delhi high court in 1994 the court categorically stated that i mean trade and business at the cost of disrupting life forms and ecology can't be allowed that means the implication of this case is 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 that i mean freedom of trade as envisaged or guaranteed under the constitution can't be cited as a as a justification for conducting <coughs> trade in wildlife or at least trade in those wildlife which are listed or which are protected under the wildlife protection act 1972 another controversial issue in the context of wildlife is tribals and its and and tribal i mean wildlife protection on the one hand and tribals and their livelihood on the other hand this issue was raised in the in a case animal and environment legal defense fund case they were decided by the supreme court in 1998 and this came up before the court regarding the permission of or granting of fishing permits in a reservoir within a national park and in this case i mean the court approved the granting of fishing permits to 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 tribals and pro, but however the court also noticed that i mean this has to be managed with strong i mean this has to be strictly controlled as far as because any sort of human intervention i mean according the supreme court's perception was that any sort of human intervention in a protected area could be dangerous to the to to the wildlife so in that case court also observed that ideally ideally the government should have provided livelihood mechanism for all those uh, tribals tribals in in a different area not in a not in a in a protected area so the implication is that the hint from this case is that i mean if possible there can be any kind of um, human intervention in a protected areas so there are quite a, quite there are quite a quite a number of other cases where the judiciary has placed but the major i mean to sum up the major issues and challenges that we that in the context of wildlife protection is again i mean to what extent we can we can balance wildlife protection on the one hand and the tribals and forest dwellers on the other hand and another another major major <coughs> major major issue highlighted including including in a government report is i mean how how we can design and determine protected areas according to ecological boundaries i mean that means to avoid artificial bound artificial administrative boundaries and again the another major issue is relating to tribals uh, tribals and forest dwellers rights is and how we can settle the customary rights of forest dwellers and tribals tribals while we we protect or designate particular areas as natural habitats and insulate those areas from tribals who has been living in this in this in this habitat for uh, from time from time immemorial thank you